Hi, my name is Gordy Hogue, and this is Community Connection. Each of us have stories, stories that help us understand each other and help to bring our community closer together. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people. People who've had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who've had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories. Community Connections is about these people and about their stories. I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting these amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Please enjoy. Welcome to Community Connections. My name is Gordy Hoag, and today's guest is a modern day BC legend. He started in radio broadcasting in Quesnel in 1968, then on to Kelowna and eventually into Vancouver. And he became a news anchor. He hosted TV variety game shows and probably holds the record in Canada for hosting more game shows than any other announcer. And then he became the weatherman, famous for the way he dressed on, on, on Global's News Hour. And he did that for 20 years, a consummate professional at home, whether, whether at home or not, whether on radio or TV, or even at Blue Frog Studios right here in our community. And in 2006, he was named to BC's Entertainment Hall of Fame. Welcome, Wayne Cox. Oh, wow. That was an introduction. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I would have expected anything less than an introduction. And now i got to live up to it. That's the oh, problem. Yeah. So Thank you, Gordy. Before we even go anywhere, let me just say this, that on behalf of everyone in the South Surrey, White Rock area, I want to thank you so very much for your amazing service over the years to this community. You and Laverne, um, I don't think you've, you've missed a, a, an event or a fundraising event say, for a million years. And we, we thank you, we appreciate it. And I don't know how many times people come up and say thank you, but I, I wanna do that on behalf of people who haven't had a chance to do that. But thank you so much for your service. Well, thank you very much, but uh, this one's about you and thank you for your <laughs> wonderful service across our, our community and across our province. And uh, we're so delighted that you decided that this is the place to be. It is, it's, it's here, a great place. And you've been a great contributor to here for so long. So can you talk about growing up and how you ended up getting into all the entertainment business and broadcasting? Oh, you want to go way back. Okay. Yeah, let's um, go. yeah it, well, it kind of started in high school. I grew up in Dunbar. I was uh, a Dunbar kid with, um, well, Sam Feldman and Bruce Allen and all, all these other guys. That uh, Anyway, I, I, through school, um, for some reason, I, I got involved in, in doing what they were called... I think they were called accept, not acceptance speeches, in, sort of an introductory speech for someone who was running for uh, school council. Um, and I would, you know, do like you did with a big introduction and things like that. And I, I found it was something I enjoyed doing. And, I, and I, it didn't bother me to get up in front of a bunch of people and, and do that. Um, and so that was, I think that was sort of the start of it. Um, and then, like you said, in, in 1968, um, I started in radio, uh, actually 68, I actually started at a, at a station called CKLG FM, which is now CFOX. But at the time, uh, CKLG FM was playing uh, orchestra music and Lester Lannan and his orchestra and, uh, you know, uh, you know, really schmaltzy stuff. And then one day that is, they decided to be the, the only underground rock and roll station west of Toronto and north of San Francisco. Wow. So you can imagine the people went to bed on Sunday night with, you know, Ray Conniff and the singers, and they woke up in the morning with Jimi Hendrix <laughs> <laughs> and a, a complete album cut. You know? So boom, it was, it, it, but that, was, that wasn't an on-air job. That was a behind the scenes job. And, and then my first on-air job, as you mentioned, was Quinnell. And then uh, just sort of went from station to station until I ended up at uh, CKNW and then um, oh CJOR and CKWX and um, uh, you know you just do the old hop around thing. And then uh, then television came calling and yeah, I just you know kept doing that and uh, game shows and talk shows and news anchoring and sports anchoring and uh, yeah it's been a wonderful career that way that way because it's been just so 
so buried. It, it, there was never a dull moment. And uh, most of the things that I did in those early days was live. It was live uh, television. It was live radio. And um, there, was just, there was something very exciting about that. Yeah. yeah. So you say you grew up in the Dunbar. Does that mean you went to Lord Bing? Well, you know, I was supposed to go to Lord Bing. Uh, and, and that's where all my friends went. Um, all the guys I grew up with and went, I went to Lord Kitchener as the elementary school and then Lord Bing was supposed to be my high school and then they changed the boundaries um, and they introduced a brand new school called Prince of Wales. But there was an old Prince of Wales that was up on uh, King Edward just, just down from Granville, sort of around Angus Drive. And that became an elementary school and they built a big a brand new high school uh, down the hill and they they redrew the boundaries and I was on the other side of the boundary and I had to go to Prince of Wales. <laughs> but all my friends went to Lord Bing at that time. Yeah. However, the, 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 uh, the silver in the dark cloud here, the silver lining was that there I was in Dunbar in this little, little house, a 33 foot lot, you know, uh, 24th and Balaclava. And I'd walk all the way down the hill to the Prince of Wales. And who was there? All the kids from Shaughnessy, oh. you know, from Marguerite and from Angus Drive. And they were living in houses that had elevators in them. You know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so, I know. So, so I was able to go to school with these people who had, you know, two and three cars. They had summer places. They had swimming pools. That I'm thinking to myself, hold it. This... This could be okay. <laughs> and so when school was over, of course, I, I go back up the hill to my little 33 foot lot bungalow and, uh, and life was normal, you know. <laughs> so, so you mentioned that uh, you started doing some introductions at school and uh, you got, got, is that a bit of a buzz or a high out of that that sort of kept you going in terms of looking at broadcasting? Yeah, well, it, it, and there was also this, uh, this thing that we did, uh, it was called Radio Info. And it was sort of a, uh, oh, just, just little bulletins and what was gonna happen during the day. And it was played over the PA system. And uh, two or three of us got together and we did that. So it was kind of like a little radio station. Um, and I really enjoyed that too. Um, and so that, that helped me get along. And the, I, remember, um, I was, remember reading an article about Johnny Carson, because I was a real big TV fan, I'd watch Mike Douglas and, and Merv Griffin and, and Johnny Carson and, and all these great shows. And I remember uh, reading an interview with Johnny and Johnny got his start in radio. And I thought, oh, oh that I'm kind of doing that at high school, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another. And that the, 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 um, the CKLG FM job allowed me to get in the building, a professional building and you use professional equipment. And so at midnight, when everyone had gone home, I would go in the production room and throw on a, a, a tape and, and record a pretend radio show. And that became my audition tape that I sent out to radio stations all over the place to try and get a job. And that job uh, became Quinnell. And, um, and that, was, that was marvelous. That was the first on-air job. So I was there for 13 months. And then I went to Kamloops. They had a brand new radio station opening up and uh, went there. And then uh, NW um, uh, came calling and I thought, if I'm gonna go back to Vancouver, there's really only one radio station I wanna be at and that's NW because the other ones were revolving doors. There were rock and roll guys and they'd be there for six months and boom, there's another guy. Be there. And that, that, uh, that proved to be okay. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and through it all, somewhere in there, it was in the NW days, I remember, I was living in New Westminster, a little house, I think it was the last house for sale that was under $20,000 in the Lower Mainland. <laughs> it, it was maybe 900 square feet. And I remember sitting at the kitchen and looking out the window in the pouring rain in New Westminster. And I saw this bright light to the south. And I kept saying, <laughs> why is it always bright down there? And I thought, I, I said to my wife at the time, I said, we're, we're going to go for a drive this weekend because <laughs> I want to see what that is. And of course, it was White Rock. 
White Rock slash South Surrey. And I was sold. I said, no, I, I, this, is, this is where I want to be. And, and my cousin, uh, we used to come and visit him every so often, Peter Doherty. And we come and see, visit the Doherty family every so often. But it, it, I was just a kid and it didn't dawn on me that he was living in the, in the you know, God's country. Um, but it, <laughs> it took many years later. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, settled, settled here in White Rock. And that was, oh gosh, that had to be like 40, 43 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, Peter tried to keep that a secret as, as most of us did, but we, our friends who are airline pilots tell us that they fly over here and there's a big, seems to be an opening over here in Tawasson as they fly yeah. over and, but they don't want to keep it, uh, announcing it too much either in terms of. No, exactly. But do you notice how many uh, uh, TV weather guys or even radio weather guys live around here? Yeah. Madrigo lives here. Uh, Russ LaCate lives here. Um, who else was, oh, uh, uh, Oh, there's, been, there's been others, but anyway, I, I oh, uh, uh, Phil Reimer was living here for oh, a while. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, we, we know, and we really shouldn't spread it around, like you say. Yeah, and and Rick Clough lived here for quite a while as well. There you go. CBC, yeah. and, but he I don't think he was a weatherman, but he probably listened to the weather when he was broadcasting on CBC. Yeah. Doing that, so. He's a smart guy, put it that way. He's a smart guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He is. As, as all broadcasters clearly are. <laughs> Talk a little about how you got into game shows and how you like that and how that was different from everything else. Yeah, game, the game show thing was kind of funny because I never really watched many game shows. Uh, it wasn't like, I, oh, I can hardly wait to do that. Um, it was pretty much a, it was pretty much a how do I feed my family uh, kind of a thing. Um, it was just one more element in, in broadcasting. And I hadn't done it before, and I had an agent, and the agent said, "Hey, they're they're uh, they're looking for a host of a, of a game show. Uh, what do you think?" And I said, "Well, yeah, sure." So I went to the audition and did a, a pretend, you know, game, and the producers liked what they saw, I guess, because they hired me. And so, uh, yeah, that, the the first one was a thing called Second Honeymoon. Uh, it was done at BCTV. And um, it was a Wink Martindale, uh, Jerry Gilden production. And it was a, a terrific game. It was a game based, it, it took all the greed out of game shows because what it was, it was like, it was like the newlywed game where you try and match answers when you don't know what the person's in. But it was kids and mom and dad. And the, the idea was that the family with the most points would win a second honeymoon for mom and dad. Yeah. Yeah. So the kids, weren't in it for you know a game or something for you know a new bike they were in it to win something for mom and dad and that was that was a wonderful element of that particular yeah. game yeah so um yeah that one I, I thought well this is this is really fun you know you go you they dress you up in a nice suit and you run out there and you you play a game and somebody wins and everybody cheers and I, what's wrong with that job you know that's kind of good and so then the, the second game came along and that was the thing called Talk About. And um, it was a, a co-production CBC and a, a company in New York City. And uh, it, was, it was a game based on words and it runs now on the, the game network um, like 4.30 in the morning or something. And did that for a couple of years and then, um, and then did uh, Acting Crazy, which is uh, a local, it, it ran across the country, but uh, it was a local production uh, out of CKVU, and uh, which is now global. Uh, no, which is now what is it now? City TV, City. but um, uh, out of the studio there where the old Vancouver show was done, and uh, that one was just based on charades. But again, it was lots of fun, and and sometimes I was just doing it. That was my only job. But other times I was also doing a radio job or maybe even a TV job at the same time. So. Um, it, it was a little crazy sometimes because sometimes it would be like a seven day work week and I wouldn't know if it was if it, if when I hit my feet hit the floor in the morning I did now do I put on a shirt and tie <laughs> and go play a game or do I just leave my jeans and sweatshirt on and go play radio you know it's one of those things so so was the the game show was there a lot more spontaneity to that than a, a more scripted uh, time before 
that you would be for a television or was there less scripted or more spontaneity? How, how, how yeah, there was, there was very little script. There was, a, there was, there was certain scripting uh, starting, the, starting the game, ending the game, uh, but during the game, uh, no. It, it, and you had to play it live. It was live to tape. Yeah. Um, and you, 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 could, you could redo a few things if there were some technical problems. But mostly you had to stick with what happened because there was either money or prizes on the line and you couldn't alter the outcome of the game. Um, so there was a lot of, for game show hosts, there's a lot of mental gymnastics involved because you're paying attention to what the people are saying. You're paying attention to the question, the answer, but also the time. It all has to be done in 22 minutes. Yeah because that's the half hour of television when you take away the commercials. It's 22 minutes of content. And in 22 minutes, you've got to start a middle and you've got to finish on time if, if you're going to have a, a winner for that day. And uh, sometimes you don't have a winner that day. It's carried on to the next day. But most times you have a winner at the end. Like uh, Jeopardy, I think, has a, a winner at the very end of the game. So all of that is a real mental gymnastics thing of timekeeping that you've got to keep in your mind. Like, I can't keep talking like I'm talking now <laughs> because we'll never end this game. But um, yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot more to it than it looks. And so people like Trebek, uh, rest in peace, uh, and, and game show hosts uh, over the years, uh, they make it look really easy, but there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Did you have any missteps of that? Are there any kind of uh, bloopers that came out of that for you? Uh, yeah, I guess there were a few, but I, you know, I, people have always asked me, oh, funny stories and everything. And I, I think, well, I, I can't really think of many because, uh, I mean, they, I'm sure they happened, but maybe I just erase them. <laughs> that's, good strategy. That's, that's what I try to do with my bloopers. Yeah, that's right. I, oh, that oh, didn't happen. Uh, no. That was no. somebody else, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, that, that, that was one element, you know, the, the game show. Thing. And then again, with the weather thing, uh, um, you know, I wasn't hired because I'm a meteorologist. That's, that's for darn sure. I think everyone <laughs> realized, that, realized that. But in the very beginning, when, when Global or BCTV at the time was putting together a Saturday morning uh, news program, it was like, two or three hours long um, and it was a morning show um, and they wanted a, an anchor and they wanted a sports person and they wanted a, a weather guy but they wanted the weather guy to go outside somewhere like go to the beach or go to a park or go to a, a softball tournament or something and yeah do the weather but also interview someone there you know oh Gordy Hogue is here and he's the organizers of this uh, tournament Gordy what's going on here today and then and then at the end, I say, oh, yeah, by the way, it's, it's going to be sunny today. <laughs> Yay! I, okay. So um, a cameraman friend of mine, actually Deb Hope's husband, oh, who yeah. is a cameraman, um, we had gone on a couple of trips together uh, covering the sports. And um, he was in on this meeting when they were putting the show together. And he threw my name on the table and just said, hey, he's not doing anything. He's just finished, you know, doing a game show. And and he's used to live television and he's used to doing stuff and uh, he'd probably be good at it. And so they contacted me and I said, sure, because I was freelancing at the time. And the Saturday morning news show represented one day of work that I didn't have. So I thought, oh, sure. And then shortly after Squire Barnes joined us. And so it was Jennifer Mather and Squire and myself. And we had a great time and we had lots of fun. And then when Norm Groman um, who was doing the news hour when he retired? I used to fill in for him um, when when I was doing this the weekend and he was doing the weekday. And he retired, and uh, they said, "Hey, do you want to do it?" And uh, I said, "Sure, yeah, I'll do that." And uh, but then it then it started to get really serious. Like people really, really were serious about. Are you sure it's going to rain? <laughs> of course it's going to rain it's vancouver it either rains or it doesn't i mean come on stop and, and then it kind of you know then it got it it it, it, it you know in the, the, the very end of it when i was I pulled the pin about six years ago it was ceasing to be fun anymore it was it was way too serious and uh, 
that's not what I do, you know. So, yeah. So when you started that, then it was a bit of a risk that they took, saying that here's here's a guy who's not a meteorologist, and you're taking a whole yeah. different a whole different approach to dealing with the weather. It's, it becomes more more human and, and interactive well, than it does. Yeah, and it was more of a. I was just a reporter. Yeah. I looked at myself as a reporter, like any reporter going on a story. Uh, you 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 know you call the call the weather office <laughs> and you say what's oh, going to happen and then then you become a communicator then you communicate what the weather office said to you to the viewers and so you could have gone directly to the weather office and he would have told you the same thing i'm going to tell you but i'm going to be wearing a hawaiian shirt and he's not you know or uh you know i it, it, it's it, it it was more of a Entertainment slash information yeah. is the way I looked at it, and uh, if you know, people seem seem to like it, okay, and yeah, I I think that most people that I talked to, and certainly I certainly enjoyed the fact that it wasn't just up there with a picture of what the clouds are looking like, but it was actually yeah. iterative and and engaging. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, uh, where did the uh, the nice shirts come from. This. <laughs> you know, I would have I would have worn one for you, but you know, I, I hate to break it to you, but it's a major fashion faux pas because it's it's after Labor Day, Gordy. It's kind of like the white white shoes, <laughs> white pants. <laughs> but some people, however, I'll let you off the hook because some people would argue the damn shirt itself is a faux pas. Right there, it's a fashion full part of you. But how it started was it, it was when I was on the news hour and always in the uh, usually always in the studio. And they decided to throw me out to Kit's Beach one night, and and I thought Kit's Beach. Oh, well, I can't have a blazer and a tie standing at Kit's Beach. This is ridiculous. So I rummaged through my closet and I only had like one or two really, really bad Hawaiian shirts. So I took the worst one <laughs> and wore it. And I popped up on screen for the first time. And I remember Tony Parsons stopped and he just said, what are you wearing? <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, Tony, I'm at the beach. So, you know, my Hawaiian shirt. That is the worst looking thing. So naturally, the next night they sent me to Kit's Beach, I wore a worse shirt. You know? And he goes, what, what, are you, what are you wearing? So uh, it just kind of snowballed from there. And, and then um, I, I was never wearing them in the studio because I thought, well, it's kind of an outdoor thing. But then one time we, we hit a, a, a period in the summer where we had really bad weather. And I remember Deb Hope saying to me one, one night, she said, you know what? She said, maybe, she said this on the air, maybe if you wore one of those Hawaiian shirts, we'd get some good weather. So I, I looked at the five day forecast and I saw that Thursday was gonna be sunny. So Wednesday, I wore a Hawaiian shirt saying, Deb, I think you're right. I'm gonna put this shirt on tonight because I think it'll bring the mojo, it'll bring the sunshine tomorrow. Well, of course it was gonna bring the sunshine anyway, but <laughs> so <laughs> after that, I started to, to wear them inside as well as outside. And it, it just became kind of fun. And it, it got to the point where I could, I could go from the 24th of May, when I, which is when they started, to Labor Day without uh, repeating a shirt. Wow, and could yeah. you still do that today? Do you still have them on? I have I have a lot of those. Some of them, though, I've uh, I've been asked to uh, to give to like charity auctions and things like that in the old days. So yeah, some of them are gone, but no, I, I still have a pretty good uh, pretty good collection upstairs that uh, is, so, it has, a, it has a shrine in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Equally as ugly as this one. Oh oh, that's a beauty, Al. Yeah yeah. Oh, that's a good one. So, and how did the highly coveted pen come about? Oh, that was, um, that was again, another one of those things. Um, always always being thrown outside in, in the public, the PNE or the, or the beach or the fairs or all these kind of things. I, I realized we're so, I was surrounded by hundreds of people uh, for like three hours on a Saturday morning and what became another Sunday morning and Saturday and Sunday night. So I went to the 
promotion de department and a guy named Barry Thompson, who actually gave me my first job in, in TV. But I went to him and, and I said, Barry, I said, I'm out there surrounded by all these people. Can't we, can't I give away like a ball cap or, or a t-shirt with BCTV on it? Or, you know, some, he says, I had a shirt. What do you think we're made of money? <laughs> and I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. The Griffiths family happens to own this place <laughs> and the Canucks and, uh, <laughs> and, and NW. I think, yeah, you can afford it. He says, ah, no, no. So he reaches down, goes in his desk, and he pulls out a bag of these eight cent stick Bic ballpoint pens, and it had BCTV on it. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I'm going to be giving these to people? And he says, it's all I got. Take it or leave it. So I took it. So the first little while I would interview, you know, I said, well, uh, Gordy, uh, thanks for being my guest I, after an interview. I said, and I, I, and I would say, gee, all, I, all I've really got for you is this ballpoint pen, but thanks. And, oh, okay. And I did that about three or four times and I realized, whoa, hold it. No, 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 I got to turn this around. So before the interview, I would say to you, Gordy, at the end of the interview, I'll, I'm going to say thanks for being my guest, and as for being my guest, I'd like to present you with this ballpoint pen. If you please, if you could just get really excited about it, like 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 really smile and say, "Oh yeah, thanks very much," you know, just show some excitement. And so I did that about three or four times, and people went along with it and everything. But the people at home didn't know it was a setup, right? So they thought that these people were really excited about this. So guess what? they got excited too <laughs> and i couldn't i, I couldn't go to save uh, up the street without packing 12 or 15 pens because people would say hey have you got one of those pens for me right so then uh, i i sort of took a, the next step and threw in a little sort of gene kaniskyism and and sort of i, I made it a, a coveted ballpoint pen yours to keep yours to cherish and yours to use in good health and, and I present them. There's, there's, that's the last incarnation right there, that black one. And it's got an autograph on it. Yeah. And um, yeah, so um, the, the pen became this uh, sort of a, a monster, actually, <laughs> because of, if I ever forgot one. And, and I remember Jimmy Patterson one time. You might recall when Jimmy Patterson um, is uh, Christmas time, his house, he kept it dark. Uh, because his uh, his daughter was kidnapped, and, uh, and so he decided not to do it. Well, the year he got the lights back up for Christmas on his house, the producer of the News Hour called him, and they were called Maureen Chant, his his lady, and said, "Would it be possible for us to do the weather forecast on the driveway of the house with the lights in the background, and just just to say, hey, you know, Jimmy's back, he's got the lights up, and everything." So they bounced it off, Jimmy, and he said, yeah, that'd be fine. We'll do that. So the crew, we arrived there on his driveway, and Mary, his wife, comes out and greets us, has us in the house for cookies and tea, <laughs> and, and waiting for Jimmy to come home. And we're all set up on the driveway, and Jimmy comes home and sits down, has cookie and tea with us. And I said, I had this stupid idea. I said, Jimmy, I said, would it be possible if you would do the weather forecast with me? I've got it all written out here, I've got it all scripted. I'll take a paragraph, you take a paragraph, I'll take a paragraph, you take a paragraph. And back at the station, they'll just change all the things like the satellite and all of that. Oh, gee, I don't know, let's have a look. So I gave him the script and he looked at it and he says, okay, okay, I'll do that. So out, out to the driveway we go and at, at, while well, we're at the driveway, I said, oh, by the way, Jimmy, I said, when we're all finished this, I'm gonna say, uh, Jimmy, thank you for being my guest. And for being my guest, I'd like to present you with a coveted ballpoint pen. And he says, oh, okay. And I said, if you could get really excited about it. <laughs> and because in my mind, I'm saying, I could have a billionaire jumping up and down on his driveway. So anyway, we, get, we do the thing. He does the thing. He does the thing. We finish. And I said, well, Jimmy, thank you for being my guest. And he says, you're welcome. And I thought, gee, he was supposed to say, now do I get this pen? And so I thought, oh, well. So I just went, 
And Jimmy, for being my guest, I'd like to present you with a coveted ballpoint. And in his eyes, he realized, oh yeah, I was supposed to say, could I have a pen? So he tries to, to he overreact. Oh, the pen, he says, the pen, the pen. <laughs> now I got a billionaire jumping up and down on the, yeah. Anyway, um, th that was in, in, you know, the pen's been presented to, uh, oh, guys like, you know, Glenn Clark and Mike Harcourt and, uh, it really it got around that's for sure sure did sure did yeah. so since you've uh, basically uh, talked a little bit about what what happened with uh being the the weather guy and uh, it sort of got repetitive and you're ready to move on how are you spending your time now well uh not doing a whole lot of much um you know for a while you mentioned uh, blue frog studios in in the beginning there um I, I decided, you know, after, well, 40, 45 years, almost 50 years in the business, it was just time, that was, that was enough, you know, but uh, one night I went to Blue Frog Studios, saw a show, and uh, Kelly and, and Juanita came up after and said hello, and we chatted for a while, and I said, hey, look, I said, uh, I retired now, and if your MC guy, I think it was Dave Chesney, I think the night yeah. was, was MC. I said, if your MC is ever sick or holidays or doesn't want to do it one night, I said, I'd love to. I love live music. I love the venue. And uh, I'd love to do it. And so Kelly said, oh, OK. And the next day, he sent me this list of shows. And and it was terrific. Uh, but now with the COVID thing, you know, uh, it just... It, it can't work, um, you know, in the enclosed area, the Blue Frog tried to make it work, you know, with, uh, with uh, plexiglass and, and everyone was sanitizing, was wiping things down. But, uh, you know, you, really, I think you could only get about 30, 35 people uh, safely under the, under the guidelines into to Blue Frog for, for a show. And it, that just, eventually it just didn't work. So. It's too bad, but it'll, you know, once we get on our feet again, I, I think it'll it'll come back and uh, yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. But other than that, um, not a whole lot. I used to do a lot of um, uh, charity uh, dinners and things like like you you do so many of them. Um, I used to do that when I was on the air, um, but once I left the air, it was almost like, um, you know. I had died or something because <laughs> you know once you once you lose the exposure out there people don't you're not top of mind uh, which is fine uh, but you know uh, that's what I did for the first little while and then yeah now just uh, usual stuff well I don't know if you can see it yeah so I, I got the, the bike stationary well it's an actual bike but it's on a little roller thing uh, you can adapt it so it makes it a stationary bike yeah um uh, so I do some biking, do some golfing, um, uh, you know, and before COVID, and got six grandkids, so that that keeps you busy. And yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's 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 okay. So, have you got any uh, any messages that you would uh, like to leave for our the people who are viewing this? So, whether now or or twenty years into the future, taking a look, oh. at what Wayne Cox has to say? Any oh. bits of wisdom or insights or comments? <laughs> Gee, you know, um, I, 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 I was once asked to, well, I did do a, a, a talk show one time and I, I turned it down about three times because I, I said, you know, talk show guys, they, they, they like to come out and they they'll do a big editorial. I said, nobody wants to know what I think. I don't even want to know what I think. <laughs> Why would anyone else? But no, it, it's a... Gosh, I don't, I, I don't know. As time goes by, you know, you, you you hope that you can have a little more wisdom than you had when you're younger, and you probably do. Um, but uh, you no, know, an old old buddy of mine he once said, and I've never forgotten it. It's 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 this: if you live by anything, it is never, ever, ever wash a good bread knife. There's an important bit of wisdom and what a wonderful message to leave for our visitors. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. It's been a delight having you here on Community Connections. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. 
please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful people. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, keep connecting. Thank you.